last year, the last year for OCAPS, I told Reese last year, I was like, if my, my score was a person, it could vote, but it couldn't drink. <laughs> <laughs> so how did I? I it's Reese would ask you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, he wanted to know like exactly. Oh, no, he's so I, I studied differently for boards than I did for OCAPS. Whether or not this strategy will be helpful for OCAPS, hard to say. But I like strategically read the BCSC instead of just reading it. I tried to think like okay, what are the concepts they're going to try and test me? How are they gonna try and test me? Like, what are the things they really want me to show mastery of? And then how are they gonna trick me? And then I tried to predict what questions they would ask from that. So I sent you guys my little like worksheet thing. I would say for each section of boards, probably 30 to 45% of the stuff that I put on my little review worksheets that I filled out ended up being a question. So you can kind of outsmart the test if you think really strategically. Um, Q banks are not going to be enough. They're going to, they're starting, to, you know, like the academy knows that everyone's doing Q banks now, and so they're starting to like outthink the Q banks. And then for glaucoma, your highest yield stuff is there's always going to be a question or two on medications, and then the treatments. So like knowing when LPI is indicated versus SLT, what glaucoma patients you do SLT on versus who doesn't respond to SLT, and then like the pathophysiology, and then Last, the pathology, which I'll leave to Dr. Mamela since he has all the good slides and I don't have any. So we'll review, the way we'll do this is just like a really quick review of the topics and then we'll just do, there's questions at the end. Like a review of medications and then questions about medications, a review of diseases and then questions. So probably the highest yield, like biggest bang for your buck because it's a short chapter, but there'll be probably at least two questions on this. Um, on this section. The best things to know are mechanisms and side effects. They'll almost always try and ask you something like that. Uh, but your prostaglandin analogs, increase uveoscleral outflow, we don't know 100% how they work, but possibly increasing the spaces between the muscles and the ciliary body um, to allow more fluid to flow out. Side effects are almost entirely ocular and cosmetic, iris pigmentation, um, less in blue-eyed patients, most in the, your yellow, uh, hazel-eyed yellow patients, periorbital fat atrophy, hypertrochiasis, redness at night, um, know that it will exacerbate herpes keratitis and also CME, so they'll try and trip you up that way. And then uveitis is an idiosyncratic response in 1% of patients. Beta blockers, aqueous suppressants that work by decreasing cyclic AMP, Know that it's most effective during the day. You get almost no IOP lowering effect from timolol that's used at night. So that second dose of timolol really doesn't get you all that much extra. And then a ton of systemic side effects. This is where they'll probably test you on timolol if they test you. The bronchospasm, bradycardia are the easy ones. Things like worsening depression, increasing serum lipids, and worsening myasthenia will be probably the things they try and trick you on. There was a question about myasthenia on my boards. Um, and then also masks hypoglycemia. And just as a side note, I had a lady who was literally getting a pacemaker placed for like severe bradycardia. I think she was in the 40s. I was like, oh, let's try stopping your Timolol. I inherited her and she was on Timolol, so I didn't start her on Timolol. Like, and her heart rate went up 20 points. So we <laughs> saved her from having to get a pacemaker. So just keep that in mind. Your alpha agonists, your bromonidine and aproclonidine, no one ever uses aproclonidine in real life, but it still shows up on tests all the time. Um, bromonidine is more alpha-2 selective than aproclonidine. It's an aqueous suppressant that lowers uh, episcleral venous pressure via unknown mechanism. So mostly we don't know how it works. And then the side effects mostly are that blepharodermatitis and follicular conjunctivitis that you guys see when the patients come in and they've got that like crusting scaly rash around their eyes. It's a lot worse with aproclonidine than it is with bromonidine. And then a lot of patients will get dry mouth and lethargy. Where they'll try and test you is this contraindication if the patient's on an MAOI or a TCA. That was also on my boards. So just keep that in mind. 
And then your carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, dorzolamide, brinzolamide, acetazolamide, methazolamide, um, targets, directly targets the carbonic anhydrase in the ciliary body. 90% has to be blocked before you see a IOP lowering effect. I think there's a question on uphill questions, like how much of it has to be blocked before you get an effect. Bitter taste uh, is a side effect. And then um, worsening of corneal edema in patients with compromised endothelial cell function. So you wouldn't want to give this to your patients with um, pseudophagic bolus keratopathy or Fuchs. And so that's probably where they'll try and test you on this. And then if you're giving oral medications, you have to know about all these other side effects, um, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, impotence, depression, renal stones, metabolic acidosis, hypokalemia. And then no diamox is metabolized by the kidney, but me uh, methazolamide is by the liver. So if you have a kidney stone patient, you can't give them acetazolamide, but you can't give them methazolamide. And then again, they'll try and trick you. You can't give diamox to patients who are on a thiazide or loop diuretic you can make them profoundly hypokalemic. Myotics, we don't really use these very much in clinical practice anymore, but they still show up on tests. Um, mostly we're talking about pilocarpine. Uh, that basically the mechanism of action is pulling on the longitudinal ciliary muscle and that tightens everything. So you get more outflow through the TM. Ton of side effects. Brow ache, meiosis, retinal detachment, cataract formation, irises, epiphora. I think I remember a question about lacrimal stenosis with use of pilocarpine. Um, increased bleeding during ocular surgery. They could try and ask you a question like that, like this patient on pilocarpine. What's the most likely reason for bleeding during surgery? And then it could be like Fuchs or blah, 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 or iris neovascularization or pilocarpine. Um, and then stomach, all kinds of crappy side effects. And then just know you can induce paradoxical angle closure because when you're, when you're stimulating the ciliary muscles, the lens iris interface is moving forward. So while really weak pilocarpine can be a treatment for pupillary block by breaking that, that mid-dilated configuration of the iris, Anything stronger is going to actually make it worse, which is why the textbook will talk about pilocarpine, but no one will ever actually use pilocarpine for sure. And then pregnancy is almost always a topic as well, just because everyone worries about all those pregnant ladies out there with glaucoma, because there's so many of them. Um, every glaucoma drop is category C, except for bromonidine, which is a class B. Prostaglandins can cause early uterine contractions, so that's why it's a contraindication. The best way to remember this is you can think of me being nine months pregnant and telling my glaucoma attending I'm going to drink this bottle of latanoprost because I can't be pregnant another day. <laughs> he told me that it wouldn't do anything, and I didn't try it. And then carbonic anhydrase neural tube can cause neural tube defects in animals, so it is thought to be a teratogen. Timolol, even though it's category C, um, is used orally all the time in pregnant ladies, so it's probably fine, but for the purposes of the test, it is a class C. And then in breastfeeding, everything that was safe in pregnancy is not safe in breastfeeding. So bromonidine, due to severe CNS depression, and beta blockers concentrate four times greater in breast milk, and so you shouldn't give them. Um, no pregnant or nursing, no nursing woman should be on a beta blocker. <laughs> okay, so we'll do our questions. 71 year old female glaucoma suspect is referred to you for evaluation. Her past medical history, she's got bradycardia and diabetes. She has dry eye, remote HSV keratitis, and some prolonged CME after cataract surgery. Basically, which of the following would the, be the best initial treatment for this patient? Anybody? Yes, four. Good job. Uh, you want to avoid latanoprost because of the history of HSV keratitis and CME. 
Timolol, you want to avoid because she's got bradycardia and also diabetes. In real life, we never avoid it because of the diabetes, but for the purposes of a test. Just like you never give beta blockers to diabetics on your steps. And then COSOFT also because it has Timolol. So SLT would actually be the best initial treatment for this patient. Your 26-year-old patient uh, with juvenile glaucoma is pregnant. She's well controlled on latanoprost and COSOPT. She asks about the safety of drops in pregnancy. What do you tell her? I would say four. four. <laughs> yes, four. So just a review again of everything we talked about. Latanoprost, uterine contractions. Carbonic anhydrase is a teratogenic, timolol class C, but likely safe, bromonidine can't be used in nursing mothers, you need to stop a few weeks before birth, and timolol is concentrated heavily in breast milk. So, answer is bromonidine. Okay. In which of the following patients is bromonidine contraindicated? Obviously, you can't get bromonidine boards. This is like a favorite of theirs because they don't want you to kill babies. So um, I think the official recommendation is less than four. You can't use bromonidine due to CNS depression. Amitriptyline is a TCA or an MAOI. I think it's a TCA. TCA. Um, so contraindicated. And then obviously, you can't use it in a breastfeeding mother. the following is not a systemic side effect of topical beta blocker therapy. Insomnia? Yes, uh, insomnia. Yeah. So if anything, you would get more like lethargy and somnolence with a beta blocker than insomnia. All the rest of those are known side effect, bradycardia, reduced libido, syncope, mood changes. I have had several male patients be upset by their beta blockers, so it does happen. Um, and we talked about alteration of serum lipids and then worsening of depression. I feel like there's been more and more a push to be aware of the psychiatric effects of glaucoma medications. So you might see something like that on the test. Your blue-eyed patient is concerned about the cosmetic side effects of prostaglandin analogs. You tell her, don't worry, iris changes in color are rare in patients with blue eyes. Iris pigmentation, when it happens, is usually associated with a risk of worsening glaucoma. All the cosmetic changes with prostaglandin analogs are reversible when you stop it. Or latanoprost has the highest incidence of redness, so we'll use bimatoprost or travoprost. Yes, number one. So it's pretty rare in blue eyes, less than 8%, but for all other eyes, it's pretty common, and it's more likely the longer you're on it. Overall, the rate is 33% of iris pigmentation changes, but your hazel-eyed green-brown, are, I think, is 80%, and then your yellow-eyed patients, it's like 85%. Um, and it's the one cosmetic side effect that is not reversible, your periorbital fat atrophy and your hypertrichiasis and the pigmentation changes around the eye are all reversible after you stop it. What's so funny? Oh, you said I don't know how to Oh, it's like a classification of hazel oh. in your BCSC. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's that? You have more yellow in your hazel, right? Yeah, yeah. I just never heard that. Like Instead of green-brown, it's like brown-yellow. You don't see it often, but it is a classification of these all. This thing is touchy, isn't it? This Bluetooth, it shouldn't have to like point it at it, but it. <laughs> <laughs> it may 
might also be running out of battery. Which of the following medication lowers IOP by targeting cyclic AMP production? Two. Shout it out! Don't be scared! Two. Yay, good. How does latanoprost work? Decreases. Sorry, increases. Decreases. Yes. What about natarsidil? That one, that's repressa. And it probably won't be on your test yet, but it's the first, the first glaucoma medication that works at the level of the trabecular meshwork to increase outflow through the TM. It just keeps asking me to sign into the internet, so maybe that's why it keeps doing this. Which of the following patients with latanoprost be the best choice for IOP lowering therapy? tricky, but basically it's trying to get you to think about all the side effects and anytime you're only going to start, um, sorry, number three should say with pigmentary glaucoma in one eye. So anytime you're going to start a latanoprost in a, like only on one eye, you have to be really aware of the cosmetic side effects. So the best choice would be the 75-year-old patient with pseudoexfoliation in both eyes. And then you would obviously avoid an inpatient with CME. Exacerbate myasthenia is most effective during the day and hardly effective at all at night. Most formulations are beta 1 receptor selective, except for which one? Taxol. I've never actually seen anybody on the taxol. Um, and it can increase your serum lipids. Acetazolamide is contraindicated in all of the following patients, except a patient with reduced liver function, a patient with a history of kidney stones, a patient taking hydrochlorothiazide or a patient with a history of anaphylaxis to sulfur. Right. And that's because acetazolamide is metabolized by the kidneys, so it's okay for the liver to their patient. Which of the following is expected with systemic carbonic anhydrase administration? Increase in serum potassium, decrease in serum glucose, metabolic alkalosis, or metabolic acidosis? Yes, you get a metabolic acidosis. In fact, I just put a guy in the hospital because I gave him a metabolic acidosis from his Timox. But his pressure was down. <laughs> Which of the following are known side effects of pilocarpine? slides and send it over to surgery. Oh yeah, go, go, go. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, on to diseases. They generally tend not to ask a lot of questions about just traditional primary open angle glaucoma because it's hard to trick you guys on it, for one. Um, and it's hard to come up with like good questions on it 
or two. It's a pretty straightforward disease and it's a pretty straightforward treatment. So the things to know are the risk factors. Obviously, ocular hypertension is the biggest one, and then age, closely followed by age. Myopia is a proven risk factor. Family history and race are also, everything else they've looked at has been kind of neither here nor there. And then just know that lowering IOP by 30% reduces the five-year risk of visual field progression from 35% to 12%. The other, I've never actually been, I don't think I've ever seen a test question on a glaucoma study ever. In fact, I don't know that I've ever seen like a question on any study ever. I think there were two on OCAPs last year. Really? Okay. Are they, were they glaucoma? No, RMP Retina. and uh, something else. But it was like, I felt like it was a wasted effort to, to learn It's all so the much to learn all the studies. It is so much. Like if you just know the concepts behind them, Lowering IOP reduces visual field progression. How many of you are surprised by that? <laughs> I mean, like, I think, I feel like, again, they're, they just want you to know the concept behind it, but they're not gonna be like, from which landmark glaucoma trial did we learn this? You know, I just don't think that that's really fair or relevant question. They don't care. They're not that big assholes. Well, they probably might. doesn't very much, but the AAO questions have had about five or six questions on glaucoma trials so far, like very specific ones, like which trial was the first one to demonstrate that such and such? Like, Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. There, were some, there were some where I was like, I've never even heard those of those questions. <laughs> those questions are not at all representative of the kind That's of questions you'll know. see on yeah. OCAPs. They're actually very, for the most part, they're very straightforward. So they came up with a new question bank this year. <coughs> yeah, I've heard about it, but I don't have access to it. But it's not very good. Like, Although, to be fair, <coughs> I actually think the OCAP questions are not very good. No, the, so the OCAP like questions are not good. So I feel like perhaps maybe the academy questions, <laughs> perhaps, are more reflective <laughs> of the quality of the yeah. OCAP. It's true. Because the OCAP questions if you're are often often very I was. I remember yeah. the first time taking OCAP. Sorry, I know we're digressing. <laughs> the first time I took OCAPs, I was like, these questions are not at all what I was expecting. They were so, was all I had done was, was opto <laughs> questions, and I was like, You expected what, like a, you know, three paragraph the, question What the heck <laughs> is going on? And also be prepared, for those of you taking it for the first time, the pictures yes. are just god awful. <laughs> like, you'll stare at it for probably a solid 10 minutes and be like, I don't even know what part of the eye I'm <laughs> Like, I really don't. And, and, then, and you, you just, just prepare yourself. No one leaves that test feeling good. <laughs> Thank you. And it's okay, we all make it somehow. Uh, so, I guess if you find yourself with a lot of free study time, maybe study the glaucoma landmark trials. I put it on the list of things to study on your own if you're so inclined. But. I guess there were two questions about it last year. Maybe that probably means there won't be any. That probably means you guys will all study for it this year and there won't be any on it this year. Oh my God. Why do I have to keep connecting? This is driving me crazy. Exfoliation syndrome. You know, they like to ask questions about genetic defects. So the LOX1 gene has been identified for pseudoexfoliation. The target-like distribution of fibrillar material on the lens, they can show you that pathology picture of all the little things standing up. Um, Transillumination defects at the pupillary margin and that moth-eaten pupil at the margin appearance. If they're showing you transillumination defects and they're at the margin, it's almost always gonna be a pseudoexfoliation patient compared to your pigmentary patients who have the transillumination defects mid-periphery. So that could be, you know, they like to compare and contrast, or like they're asking you a question about TIDs or, or iris configurations. Just know all the different glaucoma iris appearances, and they'll try and trick you that way, if that makes sense. And then SLT is really effective in anybody with a, a densely pigmented angle, but the effects generally don't last as long, and they're more likely to get a pressure spike afterwards. So they might ask you that. And then we already talked about pigment dispersion. You get your densely pigmented trabecular meshwork and a sample AC line. Um, the sample AC line is not specific just to pigmentary. You can also get it in 
pseudo exfoliation. Uh, but you get this mid peripheral spoke like iris TIDs, and then in, if they ever mention a concave iris on gonio, that is going to be pigment dispersion. Um, then the typical age group your young myopic males and the IOP spike after exercise. SLT, same thing as with pseudo X, it's really effective, but the effects don't last as long. And they're at higher risk for pressure spikes afterwards. And then they're at higher risk of hypotony with filtering surgery. Probably more because of the myopia than the, pigment, than the mechanism of their um, condition. But just know that they might try and ask you, like, which of the following patients is at higher risk for hypotony after a trabeculectomy? And it might be like a young myopic guy with pigment dispersion. And then the lens-associated glaucomas, almost always there's a question about these because they're easy to mix up when you're not really, like when you're just kind of like giving a cursory glance to them. But if you just know every single one of them has like one easily identifiable feature, then you shouldn't ever mix them up. So your phacolytic, the patient, it's caused by leakage of lens particles by a hypermature cataract. So if they don't have a cataract, they can't have phagolytic glaucoma. And it's caused by macrophages in the trabecular meshwork. Macrophages generally don't cause KP, so you're not going to have KP in this patient. Um, and then lens particle is caused by like a piece of the lens, just like it sounds. So they are your pseudophagic or your traumatic patients who no longer have a lens. You just have pieces of it, and the mechanism is actual cortical material blocking the TM. And then your phacoantigenic or phacoanaphylactic, depending on how old your BCSE is, but phacoantigenic is the newer term. You're actually sensitized to the lens protein, so this is like a true hypersensitivity immune reaction, and you will have KP, so that makes sense, right? And also, you've been sensitized to your lens proteins because we ground up your lens and released all these lens proteins and taken them out of your eye or you've had trauma. So if you have a cataract, you have phagolytic. If you don't have a cataract, you have lens particle or phagoanogenic, essentially. And then if you put them all in a chart, you can see, oops, go back. <coughs> phagolytic, angle, open, inflammation, yes, KP, absent, mature cataract, and then the mechanism. So three of the four have open. So if your ankle's closed, it's phacomorphic. If your ankle's open and you have a dense cataract, it's phacolytic. If your ankle's open and you have KP, it's phacoanogenic. Like there are just no, no like the, the key buzzwords and you'll never mix these up on a test. Does that make sense? Any questions about these? This is almost always on something. Seriously. It makes me connect to the internet every like three seconds. And then I can't advance the slides. You can just um, turn your Wi Fi off and still run the. Yes, but I have to exit out of this. the inflammatory glaucomas are fair game and they'll like to compare and contrast them. So they'll try and trick you between Posner, Schlossman, Fuchs, and then in the closed, gla closed angle glaucoma, things like ice syndrome. So they'll throw all of these together in a question and try and make you pick out which one it is. But just know Posner, Schlossman, and Fuchs, the angle is always open. And then with ice, it's the mechanism of glaucoma is angle closure. So if the angle's open, you're not getting PAS, right? That makes sense. There's nothing closing the angle off. So just keep that in mind too. They're talking about PAS, it's not one of these things. Glaucoma, cyclotic crisis, you get low grade inflammation, an IOP spike where the IOP is markedly elevated out of proportion to the amount of inflammation on exam. And they might ask you about treatment, like which of the following is the best means of treatment for this patient with Posner Schlossman, just know that steroids don't help. So 
You never put a positive Schlossman patient on steroids. All it will get you is an IOP spike. And then Fuchs heterochromic is iris heterochromia in the affected eye. On gonio, you'll see fine vessels that don't cross the TM, which is different than ice syndrome, where they do cross the TM. And the vessels don't lead to PAS formation, so just like we were talking about, the angle remains open. And then they might ask you about disease association, so Fuchs is questionably associated with rubella, which you would think then would mean we wouldn't really see it anymore because no one gets rubella, but we still see it. And then the Posner Schlossman and the questionable association with HSV or CMV. Elevated effiscleral venous pressure, so most common in these diseases, they pretty commonly will put like a, a fistula um, on the test. I think I've seen it on OCAPs maybe twice. And then your orbital varix patients can get it. Your Sturge Weber patients, the older Sturge Weber patients, I think there's often questions, um, question about this, where your young Sturge Weber patients, it's more of a, a dysgenesis of the angle structures. And the older patients, yeah. In the older patients, it's elevated episcleral venous pressure. Your thyroid eye disease patients, we had one of these at the VA the other day. Um, we'll have elevated episcleral venous pressure. Things to know, if you see blood in Schlem's canal, that's their way of telling you that this patient has elevated episcleral venous pressure. And if they offer you an SLT, don't do it. I think if you think about the mechanism of how SLT works, you should be able to logically reason out that an SLT isn't gonna work on these patients, but don't SLT them. And then you can imagine that glaucoma surgery is gonna be riskier in these patients. They're more prone to um, suprachoidal hemorrhages or effusions after surgery. So keep that in mind too. So complications from surgery is probably gonna, is, can be high yield. And then comparing hemolytic to ghost cell, um, I had questions on this on my first OCAPs. Basically, just know they both happen after vitreous hemorrhages. So they're both from the vitreous coming forward into the anterior chamber. At hemolytic, you've got the macrophages blocking the TM, so that's where you'll get like the path slide of the cells with the stuff in them, and you're like, what am I looking at? Is that supposed to be there? I don't know, I can't tell. And hopefully they'll give you some kind of clue that this patient had a vitreous hemorrhage and then you'll say, oh, those are macrophages um, with hemoglobin in them. Yay, this is hemolytic. Yes? I heard a good way to remember, like, anything with lytic in it has macrophages. So, like, phacolytic, hemolytic. Oh, that's a good, yeah. That makes sense. It's funny because I have a mnemonic for almost everything, as Sophia can attest to but not, not for glaucoma. I realize all my mnemonics are like retina or cornea. I have like, <laughs> um, and then ghost cell is the actual degenerated red blood cell products in the TM instead of the macrophages. It's also later, right? It's like with the cute, you're not gonna get a window. You can still up. get them like in, a rel in that relatively same time period, but yes. The blood products tend to be older in ghost cell versus hemolytic. I think it's got to be at least 14 days because that's the life cycle of a RBC. Okay, so yes. And then you get like the yellow khaki colored. Pupillary block. So this is the most common mechanism for angle closure. And that level of pathologies at the lens iris interface. So you're getting obstruction of flow from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber because it's blocked the level of the lens iris. So they might ask you about some kind of, what's the underlying mechanism for pupillary block and throw you a bunch of stuff about how the iris is blocking the TM, but the problem starts because fluid can't get around the lens at the iris lens interface. And then you get iris bombay and then everything shifts forward and that closes the angle off. And you're most likely to get that obstruction when the pupil is mid-dilated. So just know what the treatment recommendations are. Officially, you can try a mild cholinergic like pilocarpine to induce meiosis and get rid of that mid-peripheral iris configuration. 
But strong meiotics, they might ask you this, why wouldn't you use a strong meiotic in angle closure? It increases vascular congestion for one and then rotates the lens iris interface anteriorly so it worsens the obstruction of the angle. Definitive treatment is LPI, at least according to my BCSC. So don't do cataract surgery on them as the first line treatment yet. I mean, in real life, yes, but in BCSC OCAPS world, LPI is the answer. And then just know again, if they show you an angle closer patient, but it's not a pupillary block patient, so it's a neovascular, there's PAS, there's, if there's no component of pupillary block, LPI is not the treatment. That's how they'll try and trick you with that. Chronic angle closure, um, they might give you, they might like, tell you a story about a patient with, you know, optic nerve damage and kind of chronic migraines, and then you look in and their angles closed but doesn't open appositionally. They'll have like circumferential PAS that is chronic angle closure. Officially, the treatment is iridotomy, iridectomy, but if their angle is, is closed down with PAS, even that's probably not gonna be enough and you have to do something else. But officially, you would still do an LPI to remove any component of pupillary block that's there. And then know for any patients with a narrow angle, they might ask you, you know, what medications do you need to counsel this patient to avoid? There are a lot of the allergy and cold medications, antidepressants and neurological medica medications. I don't think they'll get this specific, but they could try and trick you that way. And then plateau iris, this one's a favorite one to ask for the angle closure because it's tricky and um, there's a lot of like exam findings they can show you to try and get you to think of it. But anytime the AC, they describe a patient with a deep AC, but a narrow angle, you should be thinking, could this be plateau iris? Or they show you a UBM and they're talking about glaucoma and the iris looks kind of funky at the angle then you should be thinking that this is plateau iris. The treatment is always LPI first to remove whatever pupillary block component is, but just know that they might tell you, oh, this patient had an LPI, which did not relieve their, their narrow angle. What would be your next step? If you think it's pupillary block, the next step would be a meiotic to pull the iris away. And then if that doesn't work, you can do iridoplasty, which I've never done. And then ice syndrome, like we talked about, they might try and throw this in with your like Posner Schlossman and um, the inflammatory glaucomas. But if you see unilateral uh, findings in women ages 20 through 50 with high PAS, you should be thinking ice syndrome. And the reason why the PAS are able to grow that high is because if you think about it, the endothelium is dysfunctional, it's diseased and so abnormal tissue that's not supposed to be there can grow. If you have a healthy endothelium, the PAS won't extend that high, if that makes sense. So like an NV patient, their PAS won't be high PAS because the endothelium, the cornea is normal. Aqueous misdirection is another favorite. So they might show you a bunch of different ACs and then ask which patient recently had cataract surgery. In aqueous misdirection, you get the uniform flattening of the AC and despite an LPI, so everything is flat. The iris is smack up against the cornea, unlike angle closure where it's iris bombay, which is relatively deep centrally and then really shallow peripherally. Treatment, the first step is intense cyclopoly, well, LPI, if you haven't done that already, is more diagnostic than therapeutic, but you have to have a patent LPI. And then intense cycloplegia, so you put them on atropine, YAG the anterior hyaloid phase, which almost never works, and then you send them to retina. They might ask you like what percentage of these patients resolve without surgery. Technically, what the book says is 50%. If you ask anybody upstairs, they'll tell you 0% resolve on their own and they all have to have surgery. <laughs> all right, so questions. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial treatment of pupillary block in a patient with microspherophagia? This is kind of a tricky one. Or. Yes. Pulls the pupil anterior, it pulls the pupil, so the anterior dislocated lens is pulled back. It's the opposite of what a meiotic does, which is pushes everything even more forward. 
dilating. So this is the only case where a pupillary block is treated with a dilating drop. Microspherophakia, that lens, anterior lens dislocation. So you're pushing everything backwards. Does that make sense? Which of the following is not a risk factor for acute narrow angle glaucoma? exfoliation is because of the zonulopathy. So myopia. But the pseudo exfoliation is where they'll try and trip you up. So you can get a severe like zonulopathy in the pseudo exfoliation patients. Those patients are at risk for angle closure. So oftentimes we'll see pseudo ex patients who also have really, really narrow angles, and that's just because their zonules are so weak that everything's really pushed up forward. The most likely glenoscopic finding in a patient with elevated IOP and radial mid-peripheral iris TIDs would be? Two. Yes, so this is your pigment dispersion patient. Um, you don't always have to have a, a case spindle in your pigment dispersion patients, but you do always have to have that pigment TM. That's like the first finding that you see usually. Bilateral PAS in an elderly hyprope is most likely secondary to three. Yeah. Eye syndrome is obviously unilateral. Acute uveitis almost always unilateral. Axenfeld anomaly. I mean, you're not going to be an elderly hyprope <laughs> with Axenfeld anomaly. You would not expect to see blood in Schlem's canal in which of the following disease processes? One. One. SLT would be the most effective in which of the following patients? Four. Four. Yeah. So SLT, not effective in traumatic glaucoma and not effective in uveitic glaucoma can make uveitis worse. Again, juvenile glaucoma tends to be more of a like AC malformation, so SLT not as effective there either. Um, and then thyroid ophthalmopathy is usually more of an episcleral venous pressure, so SLT is not effective there. So the best choice is pigmentary. Which of the following is true of laser trabeculoplasty and pseudoexfoliation glaucoma? It's less effective than in primary glaucoma. It is very effective and the effects last longer. Due to intense pigmentation of the TM, treatment will require more energy. IOP spikes are more common at lower energy settings, or none of the above are true. Okay. IOP spikes are more common with higher energy settings. So you want to do your, your really pigmented patients the, lower, the lowest possible energy you can, and then you get less IOP spikes if you're using lower settings. And it is very effective, but the effects last shorter than with your primary glaucoma patients. And the treatment requ usually requires less energy. Which of the following is the exam finding correctly matched with the disease? Which of the lens glaucomas do you get KP? That's right, they get Oops. Which exam finding would you expect to see in a patient with known Fuchs heterochromic, heterochromic iridocyclitis? Right, three. They do get KP, but they're pancorneal. This is like a really mean way to trick you, but I do remember a couple questions like that. Um, so you get pancorneal KP, fine vessels traversing the TM that don't lead to PAS formation, and then posterior subcapsular cataracts. So I feel like they like to try and trick you that way too, like, oh, anterior cataract versus posterior cataract. They're jerks. Which of the following medications should be avoided in patients with hyphema and sickle cell? This is a this is probably a high yield. So 
you shouldn't give any of these to a, a patient with sickle cell and hyphema. Dorazolamide and aproclonidine, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors increase sickling, alpha-1 agonist, alpha agonist cause anterior segment ischemia. So those ones are really specific to topical treatment for sickle cell hyphemas. And then hyperosmotics can induce a global sickle cell crisis, so you don't want to give those. And then never give pilocarpine to anybody with any type of hyphema, so that's true of whether or not they have sickle cell. The difference between hemolytic glaucoma and ghost cell glaucoma is best represented by which of the following statements? <laughs> it's a lot of words, I'm sorry. Oh. Wouldn't that be great if it were true? I was writing, yeah. I was writing these ones during um, UOS and I was getting bored. Also, it's really hard to come up with fake, like realistic fake answers. do this to you where they, they, they know you'll know the basics of it, but just remembering which one is which, and they'll switch them on you. So just make sure you have a way of remembering lytic, macrophages is a good way, um, but just have some kind of way of saying like, okay, this is this versus this is this. Describe the mechanism of angle recession, uh, glaucoma or traumatic <coughs> glaucoma. So why do you get glaucoma in these patients. There's a tear between the longitudinal and ciliary muscle, and the ciliary body restricts aqueous outflow through the TM. The tear between the iris root and the scleral spur results in scarring that will cause PAS formation. The damage to the ankle itself is not the cause of elevated IOP, but rather a sign that the TM has sustained injury, or a tear between the longitudinal and ciliary muscle. The ciliary body restricts aqueous outflow through the uveoscleral path. That answer doesn't really even make sense if you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, because you guys all agreed it was three, right? Because it doesn't make sense if you've got angle recession, why that would cause elevated IOP. You're getting more flow through that area. So what's happening is that you'll initially see probably a lower IOP, then that cleft will heal, you might get an, IO, an acute IOP spike when that cleft heals, but over the long term, they're still at risk, and that's not because of any of those angle changes that you can see, it's because the TM has been damaged. And you can't see that, but all of that other findings on gonio are your markers of the damage. Which of the following is true regarding steroid response glaucoma? The risk of steroid response is not dependent on the potency of the steroid. Patients with POAG are no more likely to experience IOP spike versus someone without pre-existing glaucoma. Only a small percentage of patients treated with steroids experience IOP elevations. A patient is unlikely to experience an IOP spike from steroids if the IOP stays normal for the first two days of therapy. All are correct or none are correct. actually none are correct. So glaucoma patients are much more likely to get an IOP spike than your average patient. And if you, patients do get an IOP spike, it should make you think, oh, maybe this patient's at risk for developing glaucoma later. Same with the traumatic glaucoma. They're at risk for glaucoma in their other eye because they just seem more prone to develop glaucoma, if that makes sense. So people who tend to spike their pressures just have a higher baseline risk of developing glaucoma somewhere. We all know that it is dependent on the potency of the steroid. Anybody who gets Durazol is gonna spike their pressure. Low to max, it's pretty uncommon. So there's a lot of questions and opto questions about like ranking the potency of the steroids. Um, and then the BCSC says 30% of patients who are treated with steroids will get a pressure spike at some point while they're on treatment, which is pretty high. But the IOP is usually 
rarely going to spike within the first two days of treatment. If it's going to spike, it's almost always after a week, at least, of therapy. So if someone comes to see you after surgery the next day and their pressure's high, they might ask you, is this a steroid response? And the answer is no, because you don't get a steroid response in the first two days. Does that make sense? Which of the following is true regarding pupillary block? It occurs when the iris is maximally dilated. It occurs when heaped up iris tissue blocks the flow of fluid out of the angle. It occurs when the flow of fluid from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber is impeded at the level of the lens iris interface. Or when chronic angle changes such as PAS or NV impede the flow of fluid out of the angle. Great, good job. Which of the following types of PAS is frequently seen in chronic angle closure? You get that creeping angle closure, and that makes sense, just you tend to close your angle off inferiorly first, and then it kind of slowly creeps around circumferentially, and so that's what that means. That's weird. 76-year-old female, three days after IOL exchange with the iris sutured IOL. Her IOP is high and her chamber is shallow. She's on Durazol and Ofloxacin, which of the following is the most likely ideology for her condition. Oh. Most likely is aqueous is number one. Aqueous misdirection because her chamber is diffusely shallow. She can theoretically have pupillary block with her iris sutured IOL but you would get more of that traditional pupillary block configuration, even though she's pseudophagic, you'd still get I like that iris bond lay configuration. And then again, if she had high IOP with routine viscal elastic, you would expect a normal chamber, and it's too early for a steroid response. But this is actually a patient that Tina and I were up with all night during my fellowship. Had this exact thing. It was not fun. Which of the following would LPI be the treatment of choice? because there is an element of pupillary block. <laughs> None of the rest of these have any component of pupillary block in them. Does that make sense? Ice syndrome, it's all PAS formation. Uh, phacoantigenic, the angle is open. And then secondary angle closure following dense PRP. Does anyone know the mechanism for that? I think my computer died. The mechanism for angle closure after PRP. I think they get, there's the, like, yeah. yeah, they get, like, dense choroidal effusions that can push everything forward. So the treatment for that is just what? Wait. And control the pressure while you're waiting. <laughs> Don't be so crazy. <laughs> Tell the rest that people should, should not get so crazy next time. I had a question about what kind of Tear cause closure, and it was like, or it was like four different things, and two of them were were retinal detachments. But you had to know that like a regmatogenous retinal detachment is definitely not going to cause angle closure. Seriously, push. There's no nothing there to push the angle forward. Yeah, it was a really hard question. <laughs> that sounds, yeah. Definitely make a list of some of these questions, and I can just kind of. I, I sort of blocked the tests out of my memory. No, I do too. I only remember the ROP. It was like, it was like what week would you, um, what week did some study say that you should start? <laughs> no, it wasn't a treatment. It was like, it was like the theory of. VEGF and angiogenesis. And oh, geez. <laughs> I don't even think that's in my current BCSE. Like, I think that that's, because it barely talks about using a Bastin. It's like, this is still controversial. Which, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> actually, there's a table. There are only really dates by BCSE. Yeah. I'm going to have to get new ones yeah, there's so a, that I can have accurate questions says. for everyone. Oh, is that why they're doing? In a patient 
With aqueous misdirection, all of the following are acceptable methods for treating elevated IOP except. Hello, is not your friend. <laughs> Almost never will this be the, we just wait this year, it will be a correct answer for something, but Pello is never the answer. It's never the answer. Just don't give it. Okay. Match the exam finding to the underlying pathology. High IOP, closed angle, flat chamber. What is that? Right, aqueous misdirection. High IOP, closed angle, iris bombay. Acute angle closure. High IOP, closed angle, high PAS above Schwalbe's lines. Ice. What is that? Ice. Ice. And then <laughs> high IOP, closed angle, and PAS that end at Schwalbe's line. So you guys see how they might try and like use all of these findings to, so just kind of, I would just make a chart or something, watch, there won't be any questions about this, but. Which of the following mechanisms is thought to be the etiology for glaucoma in aniridia patients? <laughs> You have dysgenesis of the angle structures that result in outflow obstruction. You have anterior rotation and eventual adhesion of the iris tissue to the angle. You have elevated episcleral venous pressure due to poor iris vascular outflow or chronic subclinical inflammation resulting in creeping PAS and eventual ankle closure. Right, your iris stumps get stuck. It'd be better if you actually had no iris. Yeah, the more iris you have, the less likely you are to have glaucoma for your aniridia patients. Which of the, let's see, oh, this is my favorite one. I think I've shown you guys this one before. <laughs> oh, sorry. ask you about the gla glaucoma minutia and this stuff it's just hard to study for um, so I put a couple questions in but I find this like definitely if you're prioritizing your studying start with the medications and then like the diseases but thinking strategically like mechanisms of how they're causing glaucoma and then relating that to treatment so if you understand the mechanism of the glaucoma you'll understand what the treatment is where you, you know open angle versus closed angle, high P, you know, PAS, pupillary block versus non-pupillary block, elevated episcleral venous pressure versus not, how does SLT work? And you'll, you'll be able to kind of logic through most of those answers. This stuff is just memorizing. So uveoscleral outflow is inversely proportional to intraocular pressure, measured by fluorophotometry, which we do all the time, increased by atropine, <laughs> <laughs> or responsible for about 10% of total outflow. Any guesses? Actually, three. It's about, well, according to my VCSC, it's 20% of uveal scleral outflow. This is one of the questions from the back of the book, I think. Um, uveal scleral outflow is independent of IOP, so they might just know, like, um, know the, the equation, what all the variables are, because they might use that to try and do something like this, and if you know the equation, you know uveoscleral outflow is independent from everything else. And then fluorophotometry measures aqueous production, not drainage. The best gonial lens for distinguishing appositional angle closure from sneakial angle closure. I forgot to animate that one, but you have to be able to go back. You have to be able to indent the cornea, so you have to know what lenses indent versus which ones don't. So the answer is the Zeiss four mirror. None of the rest of those can do compression gonioscopy. The rate of aqueous production. Two, two microliters per minute. Facility of aqueous outflow is best measured by. Tonography. Manometry is episcleral venous pressure, tonometry is IOP, and fluorophotometry is aqueous formation. All the following statements regarding the Goldman equation are true except. These ones are hard, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Yes, that's right. if you want. Which is following is an accurate statement regarding IOP. It is has a normal distribution when measured in large epidemiologic studies, varies two to six millimeters of mercury in individuals without glaucoma over 24 hours, transiently increased following alcohol consumption, or linearly related to um, pachymetry. Right. That's a normal variation. Patients always ask me that. Why is it so different today? Yesterday it was Yesterday it was one point today lower. It's 18. Which of the following testing strategies may allow earlier detection of glaucoma compared to standard automated perimetry? Standard automated perimetry is just visual fields. They throw that in and you're like, what does this mean? Super threshold testing, frequency doubling, confocal laser ophthalmoscopy, or all of the following are good. Yeah, two. Super threshold is like the one that they use for glass. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, super threshold testing. It's like really. It's like testing. Like, low. can you see it? Can or, or are you totally blind? Are you, can you see it? Or are you looking through your eyelid? Like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, no, you can't see it, or yes, you can, but it doesn't tell you anything more than that. Um, frequency doubling is what you'll often get on those, like, weird, like, square, boxy-looking visual fields that come from optometry, because it's a good screening test, but it doesn't give you any data to follow people over time. And then, just to review on your own, more of, like, the visual field OCT stuff, we don't have time to go over all of that. The childhood glaucomas... Not sure how much of that is really all that high yield. Again, just know that childhood glaucoma, it's almost always a surgical treatment because the anterior you know, segment isn't made right. If you're born with glaucoma, something went wrong while you were developing. The glaucoma studies, debatable on how low yield that will be. I'm interested to see if you guys get into that. And then the other kind of fair game stuff is the surgical management of glaucoma, so just knowing the risk of glaucoma surgeries, they'll probably focus on traps and tubes, which is what they usually do. And just knowing who's at risk for like superchoroidal hemorrhage and hypotony are probably the biggest high yield things. 